Um, well, good afternoon, everyone here. It's a great pleasure here to um, be representing Zenon here at uh, the G2C. I was last year at the G2C in San Jose and had really a great experience there. And I'm really glad that NVIDIA um, found the opportunity to um, launch these satellite conferences around the world and that we have it this year here also in Melbourne to give you a little more insight into um, what we can do with GPUs, what the hardware underneath is that's driving a lot of the technology and the advances that you've seen here in deep learning. And I want to give you both a little bit of an overview of what hardware, what platforms we're looking at, and then also who is using them already and what are all the benefits you can get out of it. So just to give you a, a brief introduction of who Xenon Systems is, in case you're not familiar with us yet, Xenon Systems is an Australian company tw founded 20 years ago by Dragan Dimitrovici, who's also here um, in the audience somewhere. Um, we're working with a lot of um, industries and verticals around the country in Australia, New Zealand, and also worldwide. Um, we're working with partners and customers in the defense and education space, in broadcast, finance and telecommunications, um, in research, in oil and gas, and you'll see some of our customers then um, later in the slide deck. And um, we are really trying um, to work in our niche of providing high-performance computing solutions, both on the compute side, as well as integration with the network and the storage, and building a complete integrated system um, out of that, including a complete network, um, a complete software stack. And I think that's also one of the core parts of um, the advancements in deep learning that we have now an ecosystem around the GPUs from NVIDIA, around CUDA, which is now going to the higher level QDNN libraries, for example, to the frameworks, which allow you to leverage the capabilities of the hardware in a very abstract level, much, much higher using these frameworks. And that's really part of what's also enabling this breakthrough and this proliferation of deep learning solutions nowadays, because now you can implement them in a pretty short period of time and become um, effective and pr um, have solutions in a very short period of time without having to go all the way down to programming the hardware in CUDA. You can still do that. That's still very valuable in very many applications, but it's really the software stack on top and the highest level libraries which provide the big benefits. Um, the solutions we're providing range all the way from workstations to um, accelerated uh, servers all the way to um, um, high performance com uh, supercomputing solutions and also virtualization and VDI solutions. And all of them, of course, based on NVIDIA GPU technologies. Just a, a brief history, all the things, some of the things we have done in the past. As mentioned before, we started in 1996. Um, we were one of the first providers um, to Telstra for the first digital video network. We were working with Animal Logic, for example, and many of you will recognize that um, screenshot there from the Matrix movie trilogy, which was largely rendered on, on our hardware. We've been working in the defense space with Thales, for example, for large simulator applications and provided a lot of computing solutions to um, research and um, academia around the country, including VPAC, but also um, CSIRO, and I'll come back to CSIRO then in a minute. Um, we were working with Fujitsu, for example, on the peak system on Raijin, which is installed at ANU at NCI in Canberra, for example, and we provided the network infrastructure for that. And more recently, we provided HPC systems to the University of Queensland, and we've also seen now a lot of demand in the um, biomedical um, and biochemistry areas with um, a lot of demand in genomics, and we've um, just been delivering two systems there to the Garvin Institute and to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, for example. So let's focus on the GPUs. So um, <clears throat> we delivered the, the Bragg system to CSIRO, you see some of the specs here on the side, 128 compute nodes. Um, we upgraded them um, already more than three times, going through the generations of NVIDIA GPUs all the way to the K20s right now, with 2,000 CPU cores, a total of 16 terabytes of system memory, and all tied together with an InfiniBand interconnect. And at, in 2013, the system was um, in the top, was the number 10 on the green 500. Um, and number 260 in the top 500. And that's 
a critical aspect because GPUs are also important because they give you a lot of um, power efficiency. And in supercomputing applications today, that's really one of the problems that we can't feed the beast really with enough power. Well, we can, we could, but it becomes extremely expensive because of the power usage and because of the cooling requirements. And the efficiency that you get today from um, NVIDIA GPU solutions, and in particular the latest generations with Pascal, are really what's enabling Petascale and then the Exaflop solutions which are being um, designed and developed right now. So on the Bragg system, they already um, a lot of users um, running deep learning um, applications on there on the K20s, including, of course, um, some of the users from Data61, part of, of CSRRO. And um, with deep learning, as you've seen in various presentations already today, um, a classic application is computer vision. You um, apply a learning algorithm, as also um, Professor Drummond just um, went through. You um, teach your network and then you can get answers from your network about what the computer recognizes in that image, which has, of course, lots of applications in autonomous vehicles, in medicine, and many others. So um, I just want to give you a very brief example, which we implemented in the end in seven lines of code. And you can reproduce that at home when you have the, the few bits and pieces you need for that. In the end, what it comes down to is you want to design, um, you need to design the deep neural network um, there's, of course, a lot of um, frameworks already which you can leverage for that. Then you need to train the network, which in many, in many cases is really a challenge because the tra the initially the network is like a baby. It has a fully developed brain. It has all the neurons, but it's, it needs to learn. So where do you get your data set from so that you can actually start teaching the network? And that's always one of the challenges that you need to come up with the data set so that you can actually start teaching your network. Then in this case, um, then I wanted to ask the network, how do you, what do you recognize in an image? And so then you can present new images to the network and ask, what do you see in there? And sometimes you're going to be surprised, as you're going to see in a, se in a second again. And because in the end, every network is only as good as its training. Of course, then you can start working with self-training networks where with new data sets coming in, you can improve the performance of the network. But the initial results really strongly depend on the initial training data set you have. So what in the end I used, I'll show this in a second, was a pre-trained network based on ImageNet, which you also have, I think, heard already about today a few times. And then I just grabbed a few random images off the web and asked the network, what do you see? So with the first image here in the middle, it recognized these are vegetables. Oh, it even recognized these are bell peppers. Yeah, not bad. Um, it recognizes that's a dog, and not only that's a dog, but it knows that that's a beagle. It recognizes zebra, that's pretty easy. It recognizes the duck, that's even a drake. And then I gave it the fish, and it says, that's a strainer. <laughs> Um, well, apparently that network has been cooking, but it has never been fishing before. So um, it obviously recognized the structure here of the scales on the fish and thought, oh, that looks like a strainer I've seen before, but I've never seen a fish before. So there's my little baby um, trying to tell me what it sees, but it hasn't been fishing before. So next week, and I'll go with this little network baby fishing. Um, so what's required to, to reproduce that? Um, in the end, you want a system with an NVIDIA GPU to give you the, the performance and acceleration you want. Um, the nice thing about NVIDIA is now that you not only get the hardware and the drivers, you get the complete software stack, which includes then here, it's based on, on the, o the operating system, Ubuntu 1404, with the drivers, with the QDNN library. And for this example, I used the uh, MatConf.net library, which is essentially a MATLAB, MATLAB toolbox implementing um, a convolutional neural network for computer vision applications. Then you have MATLAB on top of that, and then you just need a few lines of code. And here are the seven lines of code. So I thought I'll walk you through those seven lines, which are pretty easy enough. So in the first line, I essentially just download a pre-trained network from the MatConf.net repository. And so this is now skipping the step of training. I'm already taking advantage of somebody else having, having invested the time of having the data set and training a network, and I'm just downloading um, a network that's accessible there. And 
on the MatConf net, um, website, you can find a bunch of other networks for um, other specialized applications, I think, including character recognition and speech and others. In the second line, I load the network into MATLAB. I set up MatConfNet and initialize it. And then I already choose a test image. I want to um, ask the network what it recognizes. And so here, in this case, I just loaded this bell peppers JPEG file. And in the end, in the last two lines there, I'm using the CNN predict um, function with the model, the CNN model, and the image I just loaded, and ask, what do you recognize? And the answer comes back in a simple string in the label, and then I just attach the label to the image, and you've just Im seen the images before. So seven lines of codes, and you're an expert at deep learning, and you can do your, your own image recognition, easy enough. Um, here at the bottom, then, you also have the reference there. There is a very nice blog article um, about this technique and, and this framework, which takes it a step further off than recognizing, um, for example, cars in larger images and following them and things like that. So there is a very nice way to expand from there. But if you have the bits and pieces, this is a very nice and easy way to start. And of course, then, you take the next step with that. And I think that's also been already discussed before. Why is it that deep neural networks are now suddenly emerging everywhere, and why do we suddenly see these applications? And that's really because now we have the hardware that makes it feasible to use them both for the training, which now doesn't take years anymore, but you can do it in a matter of hours or weeks, depending on your data sets. And the results are just staggering. And um, so that's been discussed, especially with image recognition now, we have deep learning algorithms and networks which can actually outperform a human when it comes to um, recognizing images. And that's also an interesting question. What does it even mean that now the computer beats me at recognizing what's in an image? When I look at a photo, I know what's in the photo. But when you really ask yourself, when you look at a photo of 30 different dogs, would you know all the dog breeds? And so this is where this failure rate in the end of humans somewhere being on the order of 95% comes in, because nowadays I haven't found anyone who knows everything. And so that's then where the network can outperform a human, because if you train the network on a large enough data set, it will, in the end, have more accumulated knowledge than a human can in a human lifetime. And that's where machines are now taking over and are able to outperform us because they can learn so much faster. And of course, there is uh, a lot of um, users, customers, partners, um, startups out there who are using this power now um, of artificial intelligence in many, many of their applications. I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of these services online which are using that in the background. And that's, of course, only bound to grow that more and more of these online services are using AI in the background, most likely without you even recognizing it. Um, because now they're starting to adapt to the patterns they're seeing, they're getting smarter about image recognition, they're getting smarter about voice recognition, and now you can start to interact actually with these services because they are now becoming artificial intelligences. And so the performance really is what's, what's driving that. And um, we've started delivering the first GPU solutions when we introduced them in Australia. Um, with the M1060s, M2090s, the Fermi generation, going through to Kepler K20, K40, the K20s as they are right now running in the, in the BRAC cluster, for example. The K80s, as we have them outside in, in the GPU server sitting in there, and of course now with the P100s. And what's really exciting is, of course, this exponential growth in performance here, which is enabling, enabling a lot of, of, these, of this progress. And the P100, of course, right now, if you want and need that performance, there's only one platform where you can get that, and that's the NVIDIA DGX1 system, which is also on display outside, which I'll, I'll get to in a second as well. And here's the software stack I mentioned before, which is really enabling that so that you don't have to implement it in CUDA yourself. You can work with the existing math libraries, which are abstracting away the hardware you have the deep learning libraries on top of that, like QDNN, and then you have the frameworks, which are leveraging all that know-how. And a lot of them are coming already with a lot of the GPU systems, both on the DGX1 as well as on a lot of the pre-configured system we're delivering, including the 
Cafe, MatConfNet, um, Theano, Torch, TensorFlow libraries, and then you can put your application on top of that and leverage all that know-how <laughs> that goes into the development of the hardware, into the development of all the libraries. And I sometimes get the question, well, wouldn't I be better off implementing it myself in CUDA because then I can hand tune it and, and optimize the performance. And if you have the experience and if you have the time and resources to do that, you might be able to do that. The challenge is how many resources do you have? And essentially then, in the end, you would try to compete with hundreds of engineers working on the hardware, hundreds of engineers working on the drivers, the libraries underneath, and, um, and the, the frameworks. So usually you're much better off, of course, coming from the top, looking at what's the business problem, or what's the question I want to ask, and what are the libraries I can use to get to my, to my solution. And what's even more important is when then there is a, a change from one generation to the next, as we've seen it now from Cap Kepler to Pascal, introducing now NVLink, and then from Pascal going to, N to, to Volta going forward, um, you will have to update your code every time there is a, a change in the architecture. And so you're most likely much better off leveraging the work that thousands of people worldwide are doing working on these libraries, and many of them are open source. So they're even available free of charge. So that's what you want to leverage, because then you can go with that flow of um, improvements over time and leverage that without having to dig into your code underneath. And what's, what are some of the areas which are driving now the, the applications of, of AI? So of course, you have all these business processes where you record transactions, being it in a supermarket, at an airline, um, booking tickets, um, in, in healthcare, where a lot of data is recorded now. Um, then, of course, that goes into then web services, where you start working with petabyte um, size um, data sets, which Google, Facebook, all those guys, of course, are, are, are working with. Um, then the next level, going to especially video applications, you very quickly outgrow petabytes during two exabytes. And then how can, you, how can you work with handling all these data sets? And in the end, it's going to be very difficult to do that with handcrafted algorithms. In the end, you'll need um, artificial intelligence to deal with this deluge of data coming now, especially from the Internet of Things, which is throwing so much data at us in terms in coming from um, sensors, coming from machines, coming from wearable devices. Um, and so the only way to deal with data sets, which are then going to be on the order of setabytes, will be with artificial intelligence. And one of the problems is also when wh why, why this is happening now is that in the past, when we didn't have the performance and we didn't have the frameworks, the response time was too long. So people were essentially shy of asking some questions because it would take months or years to get any answers. <laughs> And it's also then difficult to ask one question when in research there's always another question and another question. In the end, you get a few answers along the way. There is never the answer at the end because there's always somebody else who asks another question. So you need to be able to scale that and you need the performance to get your answers quickly. And so you have to use techniques which allow you to do that. And with GPUs today, with deep learning, this has allowed us to ask so many more questions to data sets we've not been able to handle before. And of course, people have tried to get around that with subsampling data sets so that you shrink your data set to something down that you can handle. But a lot of the problem is that then you're leaving a lot of interesting information out and outliers, which will then be important when you actually need to, to um, recognize that these outliers are also um, happening somewhere. Um, Trying also to rely on very accurate data and perfect data is difficult. So you're better off working with a large training set, even if it's not quite perfect, because afterwards with self-training algorithms, you can improve on that as you go. And of course, now you can't really um, deploy that at scale on CPU-based systems. So again, that's where the GPUs now that really enable um, that AI is, is taking off the way it is. And Part of it is a very important part of, is, of it is also not only analyzing it, but also visualizing it. 
And when you look at a lot of um, applications nowadays, which are working, of course, in the um, deep learning and in the um, big data space, a lot of it is about visualization. And that's, in the end, then accelerated by AI and GPUs. So what does all this stuff run on? In principle, when you want to get started, you've heard machine learning today is really cool. There's a lot of things you can do. I want to get started with it. What do I do? So one of the options is you just get started with a, a simple workstation with a CUDA-compatible NVIDIA GPU, which of the current generation, all of them are. And you can start playing with it using the existing frameworks. Then you can go to specialized systems like the Xenon DevCube, which are, um, can take up to four GPUs, for example. You can go to rack-mounted servers, and now we can go up to 10 GPUs per server. And if you want to take a look outside on our stand, we have one of the models out there which can take 10, 10K 80s, for example. So we have it populated with five of them. And, of course, the ultimate system right now you want to get your hands on if you want to get the highest performance is the NVIDIA DGX1. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of interest since the launch uh, a few months ago, the initial announcement was only in April, and this is really a system that's specifically designed for deep learning, but has a lot of other applications as well. Um, some of the performance numbers, without going into too, mu too much detail, is that you're essentially getting 170 teraflops out of this system, which in the end gives you the performance of almost 250 conventional um, servers. You have eight of the latest um, Tesla generation um, P100 GPUs in there, and you have the new interconnect between the GPUs, the, the NVLink, which gives you a lot lower latency, especially five times higher bandwidth between the GPUs communicating to each other. And with the high parallelization you can get now in the deep learning algorithms, that's a core um, performance advantage you can get. You get nice other um, benefits with that of um, eight terabytes of RAID zero SSDs and um, four InfiniBand cards with 100 gigabits per second each. So, um, but it's really the Tesla P100s which make all the difference, of course. And the, P the DJX1s already have already been installed now at a, a series of um, customers, including the first one, which was launched with um, great fanfare at um, OpenAI. That was the first DJX1 that was ever delivered. Um, various universities, including New York, Stanford, and, and UC Berkeley have adopted them. Um, and also commercial enterprises like SAP, for example. They have in their research labs already now two systems um, looking at machine learning solutions for their 320,000 customers worldwide. Of course, also in the, in the medical area, um, Massachusetts General Hospital is um, interested in that and is working with a DGX1. I'm not going to go through the whole list here. But what I want to, to emphasize here is that we've also just installed the first two DGX1s in Australia at CSIRO in Canberra. Um, so Xenon Systems were the exclusive partner for um, the DGX1 for NVIDIA in um, Australia and New Zealand. And it was a great pleasure to work with um, NVIDIA and um, CSIRO on this project. And we delivered the, delivered the two systems which are now installed here. And you can see it in the, in the rack of the, of the BRAC cluster, in fact. And um, CSIRO is going to use them now initially to expand in areas such as um, medical image analysis, nanomaterial modeling, genome analysis, astronomy, earth observation, health and biosecurity, where many areas where you can apply deep learning. And what's really also interesting for those who are looking at numbers of these supercomputers is that we did our initial benchmarking on these machines as well, and we achieved um, these are non-certified, but initial um, HPL impact results of 29 teraflops, um, double precision per DGX1. And when we networked the two together with InfiniBand, we ended up with rounded 59 teraflops on those two machines. And what's really exciting about it is that um, we're getting with this 10 gigaflops per watt. And that might not mean very much to you right now, but it means that the DGX1 right now would be the number one system on the green list of green 500 if it's big enough to get onto the top 500. And that's really a remarkable um, achievement for the NVIDIA team to get this much performance um, with such a um, lot of energy efficiency into these systems. So what really enables that? Um, 
it's really the new Pascal architecture. It's a new, completely new microarchitecture that went into um, the P100s. It's the new manufacturing process, the 60 nanometer FinFEDs, which really enabled the high density, the 7 billion and 50 billion, 15 billion processes you have on these GPUs in such a small form factor and consuming still only a maximum of 300 watts. So this is where we're getting to the energy efficiency. With a conventional um, CPU system, you couldn't deliver that because you would run out of space and you would essentially run out of power. Um, what's also important is how do you need to I always call it, you need to feed the beast. The beast, in fact, in here in this case is, of course, again, the GPU. Feeding it means you need to prepare your data in memory and in the end in the GPU memory so that you can keep feeding the GPU that you get the maximum performance out of it. And a lot of applications we see on GPUs, in fact, memory constrained because they have problems um, delivering all the data and structuring them such that you can actually keep all the CUDA cores busy. And what helps with that is that um, with the high bandwidth memory, which sits essentially right on the carrier, right next to the, the GPU, enables a much higher bandwidth there. And I've mentioned the NVLink already before, um, which gives you much higher, five times higher bandwidth between the GPUs, so they can talk to each other much more efficiently than in a conventional system with based on PCI Express buses. And of course, new AI algorithms as they're being developed um, all the time, and we've seen some of the frameworks before. And so in the end, if you want to put that into context, when you compare the relative performance based on a um, GeForce GTX Titan X um, Maxwell generation system, you get a bump up with the GeForce 1080s. A single Tesla P100 gives you about um, twice the performance there when you then tie four of, of the GPUs together, you can outperform that, but in the end, when you look at the DGX1, um, your performance improvements there are almost off the charts. And that's really what makes the DGX1 so um, unique um, at this time, because the P100s deliver so much performance in such a small um, system that it's really, in the end, a supercomputer in a box. So that's essentially compressing those um, 250 nodes into a single supercomputer. Depending on your algorithm and your workloads, you can get speed ups between a factor of 10 and a, a factor of 100. Um, and now your response times, depending on the, the workflow um, and the, the uh, libraries you're using, you can get response times in the order of milliseconds rather than seconds. And so the last few slides here, um, just want to highlight again the importance of the software stack. The hardware underneath is really impressive and it's really amazing what the engineers from NVIDIA here have pulled off both in the design as well as in the challenges of the manufacturing process. But then for the user, it's important what's on top of that that allows me to actually use that in an efficient way. And so we've seen already before, you start with a GPU optimized um, Linux OS, you have your drivers on top of that. And now what's unique about the DJX1 is that it's the first appliance from NVIDIA that uses um, Docker as a containerization system to um, nicely encapsulate some of the frameworks and the libraries so that you um, can use them nicely in parallel and you don't have any driver conflicts. Whoever has been working with um, some GPU systems before and especially a variety of different frameworks and, and libraries has probably been suffering from this and containerization really nicely and allows you to encapsulate those libraries and applications so that you can avoid a lot of the conflicts we've had in the past. Now, of course, you have the QDNN and, and Nickel libraries on top of that, and then the work, um, the, um, the frameworks like Cafe, Torch, TensorFlow, and the other ones on top. And so the DGX gives you essentially a completely integrated appliance with the complete software stack, completely pre-tested, pre-configured, certified, essentially ready to go. And on top of that, you have the Digits interface, which is a very nice web interface for designing networks, training them, and also doing inference on top of that. And um, that's a, a model that works very well for the DGX, and we've also seen that for a lot of other customers when, um, who are interested in systems like that, um, but small, at a smaller scale on workstations or individual rack servers, um, that we can provide a complete solution with the software stack all the way up to um, your application level. So um, if you are worried about how can I get into this area, how can I deploy such a solution, come and talk to us, because we can take a lot of that headache away and get you all the way up to your application level right away. 
And here is just um, a shout out to some of the startups which are working in this area. Um, Mapti, Kinetica, um, Scream are really interesting because now they are essentially also providing SQL um, compatible databases which are GPU accelerated. And with that, they get tremendous performance improvements which are in the order of 50 to 200 to 300 to 1,000 times faster than your conventional database. And that's again what enables big data analysis and AI based on these huge data sets because now we can actually crunch these numbers based on the hardware technology and the software stacks on top of that which enable that. A lot of it is also graph-based analysis. So when you think about your Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever social networks, of course, it's all about networks in the terms of um, connections between people or between data sets. And so again, on the GPUs, you have very efficient libraries and um, some startups like Blaze Graph, which is in fact open source, or Graph History um, can provide solutions for that in that area, which are now becoming um, possible and available because of all the improvements in these areas. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, we'll, I'll be outside at the stand and happy to follow up with any of you if there are any more questions. <laughs>